Director of STC Foundation, and I am happy to welcome you to our second one-on-one -on -one conversation of 2015. Um, for anyone who might be new to the charms of STC Foundation, uh, we've been around since 1965. Uh, we are a separate organization from the Fantastic Union that many of you are members of, and we are here to promote and support directors and choreographers by providing opportunities for professional development, for networking, uh, forums to exchange ideas, and by increasing awareness of the impact of directors and choreographers work on the field. Uh, one of the ways that we do this is with this one-on-one -on -one series, uh, which offers insight into the creative processes of the great theater makers of our time. I am very pleased to introduce tonight's guests, uh, director John Rando and playwright David Ives. John and David have been working together for years and know quite a lot about the art of collaboration, specifically that powerful relationship between the director and the playwright. Uh, also joining us is Sash Bischoff, a director who's worked with John and David. Sash will guide the conversation tonight, so I will stop talking and let her do her job. Thank you. <laughs> So my first question for you both is how you first met and you decided to work together. Aha. Mm -hmm. my, my agent, <clears throat> 1997, my agent called me up and said, there's a, there's a young director whose work you should get to know, and he's directing all in the timing, up at, in Syracuse. And I actually went to Syracuse <laughs> in January <laughs> to see the work of this young director. And the thing is, you know, if it comes to it, go to Syracuse in midwinter because it may work out. It was, you know, it was a, uh, we just hit it off instantly. Yeah. Um, and um, I don't know, it was just, it was, it was pretty, pretty quick. Yeah, mm. the, um, the, our, our agent at the time, um, the way it went for me was that, you know, I represent David Ives and I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he said, and, um, you know, and he said, I'm going to have him come and see Gulp, your show, at, yeah. at Syracuse. And I was very happy about that, but scared at the same time. And, um, and was in Syracuse for many weeks before David arrived, freezing, cold, wet, dank. Um, <laughs> Syracuse. And uh, when David came to see it, we had, I think we had maybe one sort of tete-a-tete. -tete. And the great thing was that David was... Uh, had this I uh, had been invited by primary stages um, to remount a play that he had done like four or five years ago, Ancient History, and he was looking for a director. Mm. And um, so, you know, for me, it was really important to hit it off. Right. And, and I, I don't know, I guess we just, uh, we sort of, we did. We hit it off. We did. It was, it was wonderful. Um, and um, I should tell you before I go any further that I'm actually not very well. And if you see me bolt from the stage, don't be surprised. <laughs> it's not you, it's me. <clears throat> and that's comedy. You know, that's the, you know. We said we would turn down his microphone, though, <laughs> at that point. So can you talk a little bit more about the arc of your relationship and how it sort of developed and changed over the years of your various productions? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, the interesting thing, maybe, maybe to be right there where we were, yeah. ancient history, um, when we started working together, what I was amazed by was, um, and this play had been done before, is David's um, sort of meticulous um, perception of his own work and uh, the way he would listen to a play. Um, and I think what I learned at the time and then what I think has been really kind of one of the joys for us yeah. in terms of working is, is hearing his work and, um, and really having an ear for the language and for the sound of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that started really back with this other play. And part of that was we had this play that it had some success and then we were re-examining it yeah. anew. He was looking at it again with a new director and rewriting it. And, um, and that sort of launched us. And then what was really great was that he had all these other one acts um, that he wasn't quite sure how they f exactly how they fit together, but thought maybe there could be a second evening mm. of them. And this was in the 90s. And so we did sit around the table in his, in his um, apartment, and we read many of these plays. 
which ended up becoming an evening called Mere Mortals. Um, and then he knew he had, in the meantime, written one of the, one of the plays for that evening, um, a play called Time Flies, uh -huh. about the two mayflies who who have 24 hours to fall in yeah. love, live, and die. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and our um, our kind of that I think is probably for me one of the most interesting and compelling things is to be and kind of intimate with the script in terms of the actors that we choose and sitting in, in the living room or, or in the dining room and just hearing it again. And we often don't give them even time to read it or maybe they have a little time to read it to themselves, but we don't rehearse it. We mm -hmm. just want to hear it sort of straightforward. Just what do you think? Tell us what you, what, what you think. And from there, we, um, we get some, I'm getting buzzed. So I'll stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the funny thing about Time Flies, um, which is about two mayflies on a date, um, is that we were putting up, <clears throat> we were putting up mere mortals, and that play did not exist. And John said, you know, we really need another play, and it would be nice if it was a play to open the evening. <clears throat> and I said, um, well, that's great, but I'm getting married, you know, <laughs> next week. And he said, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can't, you know, it's no excuse, basically. And so... I, for the first time, for the only time in my life, I actually wrote something away from my writing desk. And so my, my bride and I went to Oaxaca, Mexico, and every morning Martha would go off to the swimming pool and I would sit in the room and write some pages and fax them. This tells you when this was. <laughs> fax them to John and he would just fax back, great, keep going. And, so we, and we put it in and that yeah, was it yeah. and that was how it happened. And it really was a signature piece of that evening. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, going off of what you're talking about, about the way that David listens to his work, what, what does that mean? Is, you know, what, how is the way in which he listens to it and hears it different, and how did that influence the way that you hear his work? Um, I love that question. Um, it, it's, um, it has to do with not only how the actors are, are saying the words, but how the words um, fit together in, in context and how they're almost like music. Mm -hmm. So maybe the way, the way a composer might listen to the keys on the piano. Mm -hmm. um, and um, it's a, uh, he has a remarkable ear. And it made me also stay, uh, learn uh, listening to him listen to his work. Yeah. Um, uh, so it made me learn how to listen to, to his plays. Um, and that it, can be, it can be as... Um, I want to kind of be. Uh, it can also. It can be how we might hear a line work. So sort mm -hmm. of a not necessarily a reading, but how a, how it might sound. But like a recent in a recent production in, in um, Lives of the Saints, mm -hmm. um, he has this play Enigma Variations, and um, uh, there's a. I constantly think of this because I love this line so much. Uh, but the the two there's a doppelganger play. If you didn't get to see it. There, there, there's a woman who visits a doctor, but she's afraid that she has a doppelganger. And indeed, you have to stage it with, her, with that uh, second person there sitting right next to her doing everything, so they're doing things in unison. Anyway, mm -hmm. there's a line that she has in which she says, Doctor, doctor, what can I do about deja vu? <laughs> 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 and um, it's, uh, it's that. And, and, and hearing that and hearing that rhythm yeah. and hearing that, the, the rhyme and the miracle is too is with David is that what's so, so been such a joy in these recent years is David developed a fantastic relationship with Michael Kahn hmm. who runs uh, Shakespeare, the Shakespeare Theater in Washington DC and they um, st Michael commissioned David to to uh, translate slash adapt uh, a lot of wonderful French comedy from the 18th century the 16th century the 17th century mm -hmm. um, and um, it, it forced David to essentially learn and, or become uh, a writer in iambic pentameter yeah. and rhyming couplets. And and over the over these years, watching his his work develop that way, and working on a particular show uh, last spring, the heir apparent at Classic Stage, and seeing the the music of that play and the rhythm of that play and the joy of that dialogue. Uh, has been thrilling because yeah. because I know I know David's works over so many years now and 
and being around it. And, and even in that play, which had it had in the production, Michael did a beautiful production. And then when we came to New York, David again was listening to the play. He had, he had his cast in front of you. And again, making changes based on what he's hearing and yeah. how, he, how he sees the rhythm working. So. so it seems so much of, you know, so much of collaboration is really, to me, about making changes, hmm. you know, and, and um, I actually always, I've always had the impression that you simply knew how to hear my plays anyway. <laughs> but you all, you know, one of John's great gifts is for physical comedy and seeing where that comes in, you know, which, which I don't, you know, I, I don't see. I need a director. I, you know, I am not, I'm not a playwright who wants to direct because I'd be terrible at it, you know. <laughs> I have no patience. I have, you know, I'm a playwright. I don't want process. I want results, you know. And um, directors, directors like process more than playwrights do, I think. But, um, but his his eye for seeing how to physicalize a play is extraordinary. Um, but I think uh, one thing that I think was really important for us along our journey. And, and I do want to come back to, to changing and listening to plays, was going through, going through a failure together. Mm, and yeah. um, and that, is, that is an experience that, you know, will, will rock you, will, it can destroy you. And so, it, you know, we did Dance of the Vampires together, you know, one of the great famous failed musicals. And, um, and it was like being inside a hurricane with props, basically. Yeah. It was, um, and $14 million <laughs> swirling around in the vortex. In the heart of, of Times Square. Yes. Right. I, I can tell you, and having to rehearse sometimes, literally, because the set was such a mess, and rehearsing in the lobby of the Minskoff and looking out over the, the masses, thinking, oh my god, we're doing this. It's like standing with your pants down around your ankles <laughs> in Times Square, literally. And we had a madman for a lead, i.e., I won't mention his name, Michael Crawford. And, uh, <laughs> you know, certifiably psychotic. Um, we had a producer who had never produced a show before and had, had to spend $14 million on this one. So it was all, everything that could possibly go wrong had gone wrong. And my, my mother had a horrible operation and ended up dying oh my God, during that's, previews. That's right. In a play about vampires. So, you know, it's like death, death, death. And so, um, but I had learned, I had learned a valuable lesson on that, which I think is applicable to directors too. Um, I was working with Jim Steinman on the musical of Batman. We had been approached to do the musical of Batman. And he had Dance of the Vampires running a big hit in Europe. And, and so he and I, and he took me to Stuttgart to see this musical because he wanted to convince me to do the musical. And I saw it, and I knew that I had no idea what to do with it. That, um, that there was somebody who would, but American producers wanted the book changed. I had no idea how to change the book. So I turned him down twice, um, as politely as I could. And then the, he said, well, will you give me some ideas? And I gave him some ideas. And he took those to the producers. And the producers called me up and they said, we'll give you X amount of money. Jim is your friend. He loves you. We'll give you this amount of money to work on the show. And those are actually not good reasons to work on a show if you don't know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I learned my terrible lesson on that show. It was, it was a very tough lesson to learn and it was you know the end of my friendship with Steinman and um, you know colossal um, sort of muse with and so that was that was very valuable for us to to go together and get through you know it's like it's like that it's like that fight with your wife partner spouse when you really hit the bottom and you have to you have to come back and yeah. so it was one of the most compelling moments in that journey for me um, we're riding, this is even before the journey actually started, we're riding in a cab uptown to our respective apartments and we're talking and I, and, um, I, I tell David I've got this offer to do Dance of the Vampires and he cold, he had already been on board, he was the writer and I'm like he's my buddy, he's this guy, I, I love his work and I, I was thinking that he would go Fantastic, and he looked at me and he said, Run away. <laughs> <laughs> Run away. 
<laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't actually in a cab. But it where was, was it? Our, it was at our my dining room table at a dinner party. Oh yeah. And and I remember I had a bit to drink. Do you remember this scene? And I said, I want to call everyone at this table to witness that I told this man here yes. not to do Dance of the Vampires. And so, I, you know, I, I forgot. it's not like I brooked my words very much, you know. So, so maybe it was in the cab where you were saying, run away, just run away anyway, during the rehearsal. <laughs> But I think it's amazing that you did rebound from it, you yeah. know, and that you didn't let it kill your, your collaboration yeah. together. So what yeah. was the next project after that, and how did you rebound? I, I think encores came, started coming up again. We, uh -huh. we, had, we did a few encores, and one, you know, actually John, John directed my favorite encores of all time, which was Strike Up the Band yeah. um, back yeah. in the 90s, and it was so much fun. I think encores probably was the key. That, I think yeah, that was I'd the say. biggest shift for us yeah. because there we were surrounded first off by fantastic, other fantastic artists like Rob Fisher, who was the conductor at the time, mm. and um, Kathleen Marshall, who was the artistic director, along with um, Jack Vertel, who was sort of being kind of the supervisor at the time before he came on as artistic director. And Walter was around. Walter Bobby was around. These are all people that we you know, grew to love and, yeah. and um, had w wanted to collaborate with. And at Encores, um, Walter and David developed a, a, a great way to talk about these musicals that, you know, are, you know, the whole point is that they're not quite ready. And, you know, they're, they're sort of like, we just want to look at them again and yeah. kind of respect them and love them and try to figure out how to make them yeah. presentable in concert form. And, you know, they were sort of like, you know, they developed this method of, of three pages and then a song, you know, mm -hmm. or maybe, if you're lucky, four pages, but nothing more than that. And David, again, being ruthless yeah. and focused and could hear books, and he just would take them and just... And so you would get first the big script of Strike Up the Band, for example, which was, a, which, which was two scripts, because there was the version that was done out of town where, if you don't know the story, um, it's about a cheese... Uh, Factory. A war, a war about cheese. A it's war a, yeah, about cheese. Cheese causes war. And that's out of, <laughs> in Switzerland. And then there's this other script, Strike Up the Band, later, that, the one that they actually did in the 30s, that was about chocolate. <laughs> and David very smartly said to me, I think cheese is funnier than chocolate, so we're going to go back to cheese. <laughs> so then we, we spent, uh, uh, we, you know, I, I had these th were very thick, scripts uh, from the from the originals like typewritten they were they did such fantastic work and then David would just go through them and start honing and honing and send me a draft and then I would respond to it and 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 have a feeling and then send it send it, and call him and say I think this is really great or mm. whatever it is mm -hmm. but I think working on those musicals and we did uh, maybe a dozen we overall. did a lot. We yeah, did a I think lot. it was pretty close uh, to that. But it was the best education for me in the world. You know, when, when Encores took me on, I had been to six musicals in my entire life. <laughs> you know, two of them were Sweeney Todd. And so <laughs> it, was, um, it was quite an education because um, Encores, um, I did 33 of them, and Encores at the time was six days of rehearsal, basically. And so you had to really be ready. And you had to be on your, really on your, doing your best work. And so the preparation was so much fun, you know, yeah. getting the script right. And I think, you know, I'm sure you've heard this from director of playwrights before, but just simple honesty will always get you farther than, than going along with something. And so we just, you know, um, I don't have much ego about stuff. Um, you know, if something doesn't work, I say, I say cut it or change it, but don't, do not hang on to something that does not work. And John has that great eye for what works and what doesn't, and so we did great work just yeah. sitting at my dining room table. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think that's really true. It's, um, um, there'd be times where David would say, it's not working, let's get rid of it, and my, there'd be a little piece inside of me that would break and think, yeah. crap, yeah. I don't want to lose that, but he's right. <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. great, and then and then vice versa. Then I would go to him and say the same thing, mm -hmm. and and the amazing thing is that we just both knew kind of we over the years we developed this thing where okay we just have to do that, and the 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 perfect example of this current example in Lives of the Saints, which mm -hmm. was a show that we did in the '90s, mm -hmm. and then David 
then we left it aside. It never came to New York. We did it out of town, and now we had this chance to do it again yeah, here. Yeah. And um, but David also had written new plays, so there was this chance to do some of these old plays and some of these new plays and put them together. And one in particular um, that we both were very fond of mm. um, started in previews here in New York. And well, it first actually started in rehearsal that we started to notice that there was a problem yes, with the play. And then David said we have to cut this section and that section. And I, and I was like, yeah, I know. And so we did. We would cut a, we cut a section. We got it into a better shape. And then I would show it to him. And he would say, yes, it's in a better shape, but there's still something not right. And uh, this is a play called, um, I just Babel, love it. Babels, Babels and Arms. Babels and Arms. It's really, it's just a great, <laughs> you know, it's a great idea of a play. It's these two guys bringing on this one stone, and they're going to build the tower you know, a and Babel. a Babel, and uh, <laughs> and um, and so we get into previews, and we start recognizing that it's not working. And then we did a big cut in which we told three of the the or two of the characters that you're no longer in the play. So <laughs> there were five characters in it, and then it got down, and we three. got it down to three. And then every time we would do it, I would turn to him and goes, "You know what we have to do," and I would nod. Mm -hmm. And so the next day, we we just cut the play. Mm -hmm. um, from the evening, so then we were down to six plays as opposed to seven, and um, we. Uh, but in a way, it, it just was a release. It just helped yeah. the evening. It made the evening yeah. work. It's, and, it's a kind of joyous ruthlessness, is what I would say. You know, it's kind of positive thinking ruthlessness. There's also in that in that evening, we then we, we had taken off Babel's in arms, and so <clears throat> at that point, John, we had a we had a very serious play in the middle of the act. And, um, and John said, you know what? I think that play has to go first. And I said, really? I, I don't think that's going to work. And he said, let's try it for one night. Mm. And we did it. And it was just absolutely right. And suddenly the evening fell together. And it was totally against any kind of intuition you would have to start an evening of comedies, fundamentally comedies, with a very serious play. Mm. And then but he saw that you could move into comedy, and by the end of the act, it's like when they got, after the serious play, comedy would be their relief, and then it would be more relief. And, and so um, that's, how, that's just how we do it. In fact, when we did Lives of the Saints out of town twice in the 90s, I remember being in the car with John coming back from Stockbridge, and, and I, I remember saying, you know, it's not ready. And, and John said, I think you're right, you know, and he could have just lied to me and said, no, let's do it, because primary stages would have done it. But we just had to wait 15 years, and we got it right then, yeah, you know. Yeah. We just had to be patient. And um, we also learned that the plays we were in love with were not plays that were working as well as they had, and so we had to, we had to scramble around and re I think them. With, with Lives of the Saints, the new, the new work, too, was resonant and amazing and different. Um, and so that in fact, uh, affected the, the older plays and the dialogue there. But, but I want to just talk briefly about one of the plays, the, one of the new plays, Life Signs, which is a play about a woman who is dead, who dies, and, um, but she speaks from the dead yeah. to her son. And, <laughs> and her son learns a tremendous kind of shocking reality about his mother that he had no idea that she was quite, quite uh, uh, promiscuous um, <laughs> and, and quite and in, and the interesting thing is we read that play uh, around a table and we knew it was funny we had learned that it was really really funny but we also knew that there wasn't something right about it and um, we weren't sure exactly what it was and then and so it took the first uh, few rehearsals on its feet where where we, we both looked back and David said to me I don't think we understand these people well enough. They're not. They don't seem to be people that we recognize, mm -hmm. and um, and I and I agreed with him. And he wondered if we he, we needed more backstory. We needed more about what, who they are, and uh -huh. and and I I thought that would help. And of course, the next day he walks in with this this specific and clear and brilliant rewrite, <laughs> um, and. Um, the actors had already stayed, we've already staged the play, they had, it was already on its feet and they were already working on it and they're like, whoa, this is dramatically different after when they read it. And the, but the great news is that they just um, took to it and of course it was really, yeah. then it was really clear how yeah. the play could work and be both very funny and also very touching. Because um, we knew that's what we wanted to do. We knew, we knew that there was an emotional arc there that had to be 
realized. Um, but it took both the visual, that is to say, the, the three-dimensional version of the, the play in front of us to understand where, where the writing detail could, yeah. could, could yeah. help that. I think, too, that one of, one of John's gifts, which I don't have at all, is in the midst of cutting that first play, for example, the, act, the, the main actor in that play had been with it for 15 years. He'd done it twice out of town. He, it was a great part for him. The play was not working, and he was wonderful in it. He's the nicest actor in the world. And John is great in those situations, which I would not be good in, of sitting them down, sitting the actors down and saying, listen, I'm very sorry, but we have to do this for the good of the evening. And it was hard. It was really hard on that actor. But actually, within about two days, he saw that the whole show was better. And so it was, he sort of came out of it. But, but that, those things are hard. And, and that's where I, that's why I, I so honor directors. I, I feel like directors, part of, part of what directors do that I don't do is they forgive people. You know, it's like I never forgive anybody. You know, it's like, you know, you know, diva, diva actors and actresses who who make a scene, you know, at rehearsal. I have no, I have no time for that. Basically, I would fire them or I would walk out of the room and not come back. But it's like John is amazing. You know, it's like, you know, it's like he just goes right back in and and, and I mean Michael Crawford, you know, Mr. Straightjacket, you know. <laughs> I've learned from the best. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's um, it, with this particular case, this wonderful actor Arnie Burton. Um, it was it was hard because uh, he he loves David's work, and he's originated a lot of his work, and so he was he was sad that that that, that had to go away. Um, but just um, connecting with him and talking him talking him sort of off the ledge. And letting him know it was okay to be upset, and it was okay. It's gonna, yeah. you know, it was all right. That's right. You should feel this. You were, we I think that him. is what you did for yeah. him. Yeah. Is you let him, you let him go to where he should go, so that he could come out the other yeah. side. Yeah. yeah. And of course, his performance in Everywhere got better, and um, you know. Yeah. You have such a broad span in terms of the type of work that you do together. How is your collaboration, how does it shift based on you know, doing short plays or musicals at encores or something like Air Apparent? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, well, the encores things, which is sad to say that the, the, David has retired from encores mm -hmm. with, with a tremendous, tremendous resume, 33 amazing evenings. Um, but uh, uh, the, um, the, the encores was about speed. Mm. It was about clarity. It was about the preparation and, and, and getting the script to feel like it was in a good spot. There are a couple of other ones that I, I thought were really, really quite funny and fun to do that um, uh, Face the Music. Oh my God. Yeah, which is just this, what it's like Face, Face the Music, it's the, it's a Irving Berlin musical that, um, that I believe uh, the producers was based on the original <laughs> film, actually, because um, it is it is basically the same story, and I wouldn't be surprised if Mel Brooks had seen or knew about this face the music. Anyway, um, uh, it's it's just a remarkable piece, and and it and again the same situation where it was kind of extended, and, and David and I working together really quickly. He he getting me the draft, and by that time we were in a good rhythm at Encores because that was like number eight or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and then when we got into rehearsal, he would, he would listen to it, uh, and then he would come, just give me a few notes, cut this, change that. Um, and I would ask um, maybe this a little bit different or whatever it was. And then he wouldn't come back until the end of the week when we did a run through. Mm -hmm. um, and then he'd see the invited dress. And it was like a really quick rhythm yeah. and really great. That's you know, the adaption work, mm -hmm. ad adaptation work. And then there was something like *Air Apparent*, um, which um, you know, which we both. I think we both, because classic stage, it's a very strange space, and in previews, we felt we had something really, really beautiful and really wonderful and kind of just amazing and not hadn't been really seen and heard in New York 
in a while, this kind of classical work. Mm -hmm. And it, it was hard to tell. The audiences were so odd, and we couldn't figure <laughs> out, were they responding? Were yeah. they enjoying it? Were they laughing? I, we couldn't quite figure that out. Mm -hmm. And it would make us crazy. But what was also really great is the next day in rehearsal, boom, I was right at it. I knew, wherever we felt it was weak, mm -hmm. that's where we were going to work, and we would just spend an hour on like four seconds of the play. Or we both went, we're not setting it up right. We're still not setting it up right. And he rewrote a little speech that where, where, the, where, the, where um, uh, uh, the, the, the servant character breaks the fourth wall and says, are you getting this? Are you getting this? You're not getting this? Well, here, let me repeat everything that we just did. And, it, and then, and somehow that kind of shocked the audience awake and kind of made them see. And then I said, I don't, still don't think that we're getting it. So I'm, I'm going to do, I'm going to do something. And then I just, right at the beginning of the of the show, as the lights were coming down, I had, you know, the young lovers come out and just kind of make a pose, a kind of glorious sort of French Watteau painting pose for us, right in the middle of the of the of the set. And then the light went out on them, and then the play started. And somehow all of that work in previews kind of coalesced mm -hmm. and uh, and fortunately we we got nice press out of it and the audiences seemed to start really enjoying it <laughs> and that that adding that prologue was was extraordinary <clears throat> it's what i would never see as a playwright and why i need a director i would also <clears throat> add that what what john discovered which i could not put my finger on is is that what we had seen in the rehearsal hall was fundamental we were looking at a proscenium play and when we got to <clears throat> classic stage, you know, it's three quarters, three quarters round, and he basically had to make it three-dimensional, which is very hard. Comedy in three quarters round is very hard because only two-thirds of the people can get the joke at the same time. And so he re-blocked it, and that, to me, was where it really took off, was just by, was by um, finding where they needed to be and just erasing your blocking. Yeah, that, that, I, th I couldn't agree more. The staging... Again, you know, and th this is, we're talking iambic pentameter, rhyming couplets, um, you know, period clothing. It's all of that, that, you know, you need to see it and you need to get it up there and you need to see, oh, right, they can't see him. They can't see Paxton Whitehead uh, have a reaction to that. Okay, so we're going to have to move this upstate. We're going to move that. Uh, and sure, then I'd be like in the audience that night. Ah, they're laughing. Great. Okay, we've got that side yeah. of the house. Now how can we get that side of the house? Yeah. You know, and that kind of thing where you're really... You're really on your toes, like yeah. incredibly, um, and it's a marvel. It's a, it's a you know marvel to, to that that idea of three dimensions. Um, yes, yeah. uh, I think that also one of the what you were asking before about uh, about how we coalesce, and I think it's so important that it's it's not only encores, but but that John is a musical theater director, and so you know so much of what I write depends on. On, it's like these, these plays and rhyming couplets, mm -hmm. you know, they're very precise. Mm -hmm. And so you have to find a way to be precise and yet alive. And that's what musical theater teaches you how to do. Mm -hmm. And that's why John is, is so good at these plays, even the little short plays, right. you know, they're, they're, yeah. they're little songs that, that have to be treated like and that. And I would say with David, David, um, when we were doing, when Mere Mortals was running at primary stages for the first time, not off Broadway yet, hadn't moved, hadn't transferred to its commercial venue, this is 98, that's when David was just starting at Encores, and he called, or he spoke to Jack and Vertel and to Kathleen Marshall and said, you know, there's, you gotta go see this, my show there, there you might be interested in this guy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's to David's credit that I actually was introduced to them and that I got strike up the band yeah. um, and then uh, that led uh, these young producers um, who knew me and who knew my work but didn't know I can do musicals call me up and say um, we 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 think you can do musicals didn't you do that thing strike up the band this year oh and I said yeah and they said well we have the show we have the show um, and we want you to go see it. It's, a, uh, it's, it's in the fringe. And I said, I can. I'm, I'm out of town. Can you send it to me? And they said, sure. And they sent it to me. And it was, you're in town. And, um, and so that, that kind of, that, this kind of linking, yeah. you know, and that's how theater in New York City works, yeah. is that your friends, you know, start to help, you know, find, so you find your path 
through the writers you know and then through the other directors and before you know it there's a kind of community that's mm -hmm. that's interested in what you're doing yeah i i um i talked before about the 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 mistake of the mistake i made on in taking on dance of the vampires there was another there was another lesson that that had to do with john sort of tangentially, which is that I had a play in the 90s, just after we'd started working together. I had a play that was supposed to go up, and I wanted John to direct it. And the artistic director, who is not the easiest person in the world, the artistic director of this theater would not, would not let John direct it. And I could, actually what she did was she said, oh, I'll think about it. I will think about it. And she continued to think about it for months until it was too late. And then she came up with a director that I did not want at all. And um, so we decided that we were going to audition directors for this play. So we, we had a bunch of people in to, um, to talk to us. And we ended, up with, uh, we ended up with a director who interviewed very well. And, um, and it was... It was a, it was a, a, an incredible disaster. It was just, and I should have stuck to my guns mm -hmm. and simply said, no, you can't do the play if John does not direct it. And so that was, that was another key mistake. Do not, do not put your play out for lottery. And I think if you're gonna interview to be, you know, for a job <coughs> as a director, you'd better be sure of what you're getting into because the, the director I ended up with was totally out of sympathy with with the play, and after three days, we, I remember three days into the, into the process, we were walking to the theater and we were not, we had nothing to say to each other. Mm. Yeah. And that, that tells you everything right there. Because yeah. collaboration is nothing but keeping up the conversation. <laughs> you know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's true, it's really, yeah. really well put. So you've talked about this a little bit already, but so what is it that you look for in a director and what does John bring to the table that other directors don't? Well, John can direct anything. Yeah. You know, that's you know, he 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 has a quiver full of, of, of arrows, and um, that goes, you know, it's like ancient history. This play that that was sort of our first big project here in New York, was a play, a relationship play, a two-hander, about a Jewish woman and a and a waspish guy. Serious play with with comedy, and he was brilliant at it. And you know, I'd only seen him do comedy, and mm. so. That was that was quite a revelation, and um, so he can he can just do it all. But I, you know, it's hard. I I had a director uh, back in the '80s who did a lot of the the one acts the first time around, and um, that was at the Manhattan Punchline. And I remember how I got how I got that director was that. Um, Steve Kaplan of the, of the Manhattan Punchline said, I, it was sure thing, if you know that play, it's about two people in a, in a cafe and a bell rings and the conversation keeps going back and forth. Anyway, um, Steve Kaplan said to me, I know exactly the director for this play. And so he, um, I meet this director and you know, usually when you have that, when, you, when you're just meeting somebody, you go through, oh, I love your work and you know, this is a fantastic play and and all that stuff, you know. You usually go through that for five minutes and then you talk about yourselves and then you talk, none of this. I, I met this man and he said, how do you do? Um, I like your play very much, but you go wrong on page 12. Let me show you how. And, and, and he turned to page 12, but the thing was, he was right. He was absolutely right. And I had not seen that. And it was a key, it was a key thing. And so we just started talking technically. The problem was that that relationship remained technical. It was always, it was always on that level. It was, it was, it was not true collaboration. It was, it was something else. And he did brilliant, brilliant work. He was a brilliant technical director, but our relationship was always. It was like it was like a Tennessee Williams play, you know. It was like, and I think I think I was Blanche Dubois, you know, <laughs> um, in that in that. Um, and so uh, we had a we had a terrible falling out, and um, um, I couldn't. So that was what I was not um, not looking for 
Um, I was going to add, add to it. Um, I, one, one of the things that happened over the years, because we've been working now so long in, in the city and so much, and, um, and one of the, I, I believe one of the great things about our relationship now is that, um, frankly, is that David works also with Michael Kahn, that he works, he did a, a fantastic, gorgeous production with Walter Bobby of Venus mm -hmm. and Fur, and, um, and I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of these other directors, and I'm a big fan of David, and, and so when, when we do something together, I feel like, oh, he has something for Rando. Mm -hmm. He wants something that I can bring to this mm -hmm. particular piece. Um, and, and so when he calls or, or, when, or when we decide on something, mm. it's, it's, it feels mm -hmm. like it's, it's unique, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and made for us, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then what is it that takes it from that level of working with a great director who technically you're on the same page with? What is it that takes it from that to true great collaboration for you? Talking, just talking and yeah. making, it, making it right. You, you have to have your eyes on the same thing. You know, you, mm -hmm. can't, you can't be involved in yourself. You can't be involved in, any, in, in, in anything except what is going to make this better. And trying to, trying to figure that out. Um, and trusting, trusting that the other person knows their craft and all of the aspects of that craft that you have no idea mm -hmm. about. Yeah. Um, I, I also go to that place of, um, in terms of a director collaborating with a writer, going to that place where, because as I told you at the beginning, David is a great listener. Mm -hmm. And so when he goes to hear his plays, I, you know, I'm checking him out. I'm thinking, <laughs> how, how is he hearing it? Yeah. And then he might say something that he, that, that he may be in, intuiting or something, or that he's heard something. You know, give me a thought or a note. But then it'll, it may not be exactly what the quote unquote the fix might be. Yeah. But, but it's like, oh, okay, he's, there's an irritant here. There's something not right. What is it exactly? And then so in my mind, I'm kind of going through the same, the same thing and listening to the play mm -hmm. with, with that filter, mm -hmm. with my directorial filter and thinking, Okay, David, there's something about what's going on right now. One of the plays that we did in Lives, in Lives of the Saints, Enigma Variations, we talked about it. Um, he was hearing it, um, and, and it was clear that he, he wasn't sure why it wasn't building. Mm. And then he heard some things. He said, you know, I think maybe the, we need to get more voices involved, and then we need to build. And, um, and then I thought, oh, that's, that's a great idea. And then it was just this great ping pong match yeah. of, of going into a rehearsal and, and re, he restructured the play a bit and then, and then I worked with, and then he would just leave it to us and then he'd be gone and then I'd work with the actors, he'd come in and hear it and then he'd like be marvel at what we had done yeah. and then he would then say something else and then I'd go back the next day and so we had this kind of fantastic um, collaborative, that, that truly was, a, that particular piece was truly a, a, a trio yeah. because mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't think we can't do our work, collaborative work without that third person in the room, which is the company of actors. Mm -hmm. And you know, and as I told you, that's where we start every time. If he has something new, and we're, we're, we're looking forward to hearing it mm -hmm. in a few weeks in his room, just with some people, to make sure that we, we know what we're listening to. Mm -hmm. So again, it's that, it's that trio of, of actor, director, and uh, director, writer, and actor. Mm -hmm. I, I, I also think there's one aspect of, of the way we work together which is probably rare. And you know, because I've worked at Encores and I've been, you know, I've been, I've been writing for a long time. Too long, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I've been writing for a long time, so I've worked with a lot of directors. And um, um, one thing that, the thing that I think is unusual is that when we're in the room in rehearsal, I am, I am a little more present with the actors than I think a lot of playwrights are, and John lets that happen, which is kind of part of the miracle of this collaboration, because sometimes I'll just pipe up and say, well, what about this? You know, and not every director is that, you know, certainly not. In fact, I remember, I told you about the director that I got by, by way of interview, and about a week into rehearsal, she turned to me in front of the actors and said, would you please stop talking to the actors? 
and so, and and I said, well, <laughs> that's it. I'm gone. And, and so, um, and I rem and I was so angry. I was just so angry about the way this whole thing was going that um, this is why I'm not a director. I just stayed away from rehearsal. I thought, fuck it, you know. So then I went to tech, and I walked into tech when they were lighting the scene, and they were running the scene and running the scene, and. Um, it's a scene that takes place in a cafe at lunchtime, and it's and it's lit for night. You know, it's like it's all it's a it's a nighttime scene, and so I went over to where the director was and I said, um, I'm sorry, this the first line in the scene is, um, what do you want for lunch? And it seems to be lit for night, <laughs> and there was a long pause and she turned to the lighting designer and she said, light this for daytime, and she got up and she walked to the other side of the room. And so that was the end of that. I never, I never saw the play. You know, I never came back to see it because I could just tell where, you know, where it was. Oh God! I, I create a room, and it's easy with David because I feel like, I feel like I'm working with somebody in our, a unique voice in the American mm -hmm. theater, and so it's like I create a room in which, we all talk. Mm -hmm. You know, as you know, it's like I want to hear from the actors. I want to hear from the writer. I want the writer to, to, to give, give voice to to his thoughts to the actors. I want the actors to give voice to the writer. I want the, write, the actors to give voice to me. I want to give voice. So, so that way everyone is collaborating, everyone's communicating, everyone's, and you know what, that just ultimately as a director, what that means is you just have to be confident, know that you've got, you've got the skill, know that you've got the, the, the strength of being, know that you've got the respect and allow Allow art to happen. Allow process to happen, mm -hmm. um, and don't have to feel like you have to dictate, but rather inspire. Mm -hmm. And 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 then I find that my most inspirational thoughts come in come in an environment like that. I'm I'm so much more effective and more um, inventive and more alive if I feel like others are around me are also are also percolating in, on the stove and have great things going on mm -hmm. in their heads. Um, yeah. So what is the rehearsal process like for <laughs> working on David's work? Table work, as everybody knows, it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. getting, getting this, um, getting the, listening to the play. And then if it's, if it's one of his um, uh, classic plays reinvented. It's really also getting used to the rhythm, getting used to the meter, speech, voice, hearing all that sound. Mm -hmm. And then, um, if it's one act plays, it's about all these different characters that these actors have to go through and mm -hmm. play, and helping them find it. Mm -hmm. And then it's, um, I'll, 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 I'll have an, I'll have a really strong idea about how the play might st be staged, or, or how visually it might look, and how, therefore how, how, how these certain beats are going to happen, how the monkeys are going to are going to get their peanuts and how they're, they're going to get their bananas and what they're going to yeah. do and how they're going to do it in slow motion and, and how I'll have all of this, I'll have it all in my head, you know, and then I'll do my best to pretend like it's just all being invented right in the room right then and I'll do my best to, to, to just, you know, and, and ask questions and, and then um, what if and, um, you know, and then and and be with those actors, especially his plays are not easy to memorize. You know, there's the, mm -hmm. that great time where you try try you know being in the universal language and and speaking in Unamunda yeah. and actually trying to make that that language uh, alive, which it's beautiful on the page and it's beautiful mm -hmm. to hear, but it takes a while. And that was like when I first was working with David, it was like, okay, we, we, you need to be here because we need to hear it. Mm -hmm. We don't know actually how to pronounce some of these, mm -hmm. some of these, <laughs> some of these words. And um, um, it's, it's just that kind of a thing. I, I like to create a room like that, um, invention, 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 and a place to ha for that to happen. Mm. But you yourself, Sash, you've, you've been in the room, you've seen it. But, yeah. it, you know, I feel like John Rando directs, you know, so much of his direction is infusing the room with positive energy. Yeah. And don't you, don't you, didn't yes, you see absolutely. that? I mean, it's like, and the trust, you know, that things are going to work out. It's like on this last play, there was one, one character in one play that was just so worrying me. And John would go, yeah, yeah. Maybe, but he knew I was wrong. He absolutely knew I was wrong. Mm -hmm. And so he just waited. He waited and he worked and he worked and that character became so beautiful. And so, 
You know, that's why I'm not a director, it's why he is. But that joy is so important of mm -hmm. making them feel like they're not, they're not your puppets, they are your collaborators and we want your ideas. And um, it's, it's joyous. It's yeah. She wants to stop us, I think. Oh, are we out of time? Okay. Take a few questions Great. from the audience as a good note to, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> to pause on. Um, so we have a few minutes, so we can take a few questions from all of you. So what you got for us? No questions. <laughs> yes. Um, how would you say that you work with, especially the rhyming poetry? Yeah. Um, like something like Don Juan in Chicago. Like, wow. Cool. Oh, wow. Like it's such a. There's so much rhyme. The do you do you always push for it? Do you sometimes step over it? Is it sort of a marriage of everything? Is it? Is it all in the timing? Nah. Well, Don Juan, Don Juan in Chicago was a play I wrote in the, in the 90s before I met John. And um, there, there are sections in verse in it. I really didn't know how to write verse then, and so I can't <laughs> use that as much of, a, of, a, of, a, um, <clears throat> of, a, of an example. Um, the Heir Apparent is, is a, you know, that's a recent one. And, um, that is, is it, and um, there's some really in, incredible uh, rhyme schemes in that play that are, um, they're kind of like, um, they're almost, it's almost like an Olympic sport. Yeah. Um, the, other, the other play that I, the play that, uh, the play I want to just talk, it's not quite rhyming, but, but it does help uh, when, I, when I talk about listening. Um, in Lives of the Saints, there's a play, uh, one of the original plays, uh, it's soap opera, and it's about, the, it's based on the Maytag repairman falling in love with his washing machine, right? And um, the actors um, th in this particular company, uh, Carson Elrod, who did a marvelous, amazing job as playing the Maypole repairman, um, what he, and he, he is the Ivesian actor. I mean, he does a lot of David's work. We've worked together. And in verse. And in verse. Mm -hmm. And it was remarkable how this play baffled him a bit. And it was confusing to him in rehearsal. And um, the thing that I knew about the play, having done it before, and the, the, and the one thing that we both knew was there, there was a, a joy in the discovery of the kind of crazy puns mm. that are in this play, the washing machine puns. The, one of my favorite moments is he's, he's breaking up with the washing machine and, he's, and he says, um, uh, it's uh, the, the um, uh, goodbye and be of good cheer and he pulls out, uh, <laughs> he pulls out the all temperature and then he, then he says, the tide has turned and he pulls out. And it's just this remarkable, this silly, wonderful poetry, in a sense, and um, but the actor through and it's, it happens throughout the play. Both the actor for for that actor and for the washing machine, the woman who plays the washing machine, and there was simply nothing we could do to help them fully understand that stuff until they settled into the story and they were just being in the story, being in love, you know, and 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 allowing the audience to catch up to it because the audience is, is they're listening and actually it takes them with David's work it takes them time to hear it all and they have to kind of hear and recognize oh oh I get it that's where that is um, you know he's he's having a fight with her and he says uh, and she says something to him and he says I I don't believe you that's just spin right which is this brilliant thing to say to a washing machine right um, and it got, exactly, and it just, the actors, when we first started out, they, they, they didn't recognize this idea. They smelt it, but they weren't quite clear. And it, it's just a matter of listening, and then I, then I think it's those really kind of basic things for actors too. It's like consonants, it's like volume, it's like focus of line. Um, those really concrete things, old school teachings, are 
vital to the success of, of working with this David's work. That's what I mean by hearing it, you know, and the music of it. It's like you have to play the instrument, you know. Be sure you're, we're hearing the entire sentence. Be, be sure we have the right volume, you know, for it. I, think, I, I sometimes think part of my, my job in the room is to help them find the right attack on, on the music. And there was, a, there was a day in soap opera, actually, where I think Liv, who was playing the washing machine, saw something. Because I, I fundamentally gave her a line reading. You know, it wasn't quite a line reading. But she had a, she had a line, and um, the, the Maytag repairman's girlfriend is named Mabel. And the, and the washing machine is sort of, you know, putting, putting Mabel down. And she says, can Mabel scrub at the sub-atomic level? <laughs> and when I pointed out to Liv that there was scrub and sub, I think that she just started locking in more to things like that. And it, like, brightened her attack on the language. But I will tell you that when we were doing Air Apparent together, I don't remember John ever talking about verse. And that's part of casting. You cast people who know how to do it. And you can remind them about consonants. But I don't remember him ever, ever talking about verse because he was, he was, he was more interested in so many other things. And the verse actually took care of itself because we had hired the right people to do it. Yeah. Um, a couple of different things that are connected. Do you guys ever disagree? And when you do, how do you sort of manage that within the process? And um, is, is David equally involved in casting? And who, who holds more weight with regard to casting? Great. I'll, I'll do the casting thing. Um, David is very involved in casting. I, I, don't, like to, I don't like to do a play without, without him in the room casting with me. And um, mainly because... I'll get close and I'll see, I'll see somebody that I really think is cool um, or really interesting. And, um, but I've got to be sure that David also does. Because look, here's the deal, especially if it's a new play or even if he's going to do some revisions on an old play or a play that's been done before, he needs to be completely in tune with what's going on in the room. And if there's an actor that puts him off or an actor that is not really right or whatever it is, he's not going to write it as interestingly. So for me, it, that, that process is really critical and vital, vital, vital. It's also a way for us to, to learn what we have and to learn what the strengths are going to be and where the weaknesses will be. So we're able to have kind of a quick, quick uh, shorthand. We, had a, we cast a, a young actor that we didn't know, either of us, in, um, in uh, The Heir Apparent. And, um, and, we, we, and he struggled for many weeks in the, before some, some miracle happened. And, and in the middle of previews, somehow the, he started to lift, just come off the ground somehow. And, um, and it was, it, it, David was worried, and I was patient. And I just, I, 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 knew, we had seen, yeah. I yeah. knew we had seen something in the room. Because we both were excited in the, what I mean by the room, in the audition room. We were both excited by this guy when he first walked in. And we both were like, oh, that's an interesting guy. That's an interesting take. We hadn't thought of that. Oh, it's kind of good. So that was our initial appeal. And that's what an audience usually walks into a theater with. They, if what we're experiencing initially with this actor, then truly the first time they see our play, they're going to have some of that, at least a, at least a kernel of that. And I know that. So, all the struggle through rehearsal of the actor not and you know he was in a, he was in he really one of his first new york shows and he was he was in a room with formidable actors who were were seasoned vets who didn't take you know slacking or anything for an answer you know were ready to just bite his head off basically if he failed so i had to manage that you know <laughs> and manage it i did you know it, but because i had remembered what i liked about this guy from the beginning and what we both hooked onto there so that's the casting issue um, I, don't, I don't actually remember ever having a violent disagreement with John about anything. I, I don't know. Maybe it just, it all goes into talk. It just, you know, it's all, it's all just talk. It's, uh, we don't confront each other about things. I, I can't, you know, uh, uh, you know. I'm not, I'm not one of those playwrights who, who stalks into a theater and goes, that is wrong and it must change, you know. I, um, I, I'm just not that way, especially if I've been in the process, you know. And so... 
I, I have to say I don't remember violent disagreements. I, I like to, I I, well, here's what I like, I, and it, well, how I answer that question is that if there's something, if there's a problem with something, and if it's, if it's bothering, if it's an irritant to David, and vice versa, if it's an irritant to me, we have a relationship or a collaboration in which we can talk to each other and say, look, I, you know, th this, you know, John, mm -hmm. this is not, that's not, I know, mm -hmm. I know, give me time, I'm not there yet, or I'll have a shorthand or I'll say, You're, I didn't think of that, oh my God, let's, let's try this, what about this? Or I'll have another idea and vice versa. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll have like uh, David, um, what do we do about this play? <laughs> 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 and he'll go, let's cut the play. And I'll go, oh, I didn't want you to say that. But then we'll do it, you know. We, we kind of, we, we, I, I believe, you know, everyone's in it together and you have to all, um, and um, I'm willing also, I like giving up on things. I like thinking, if, okay, if that's not, if there's a reason why that's bothering David, there's a reason why. So good, okay, let's get rid of it. Let's get rid of it, even if, I'm, even if it's one of the best gags I've ever invented. And believe me, there have been a lot. Yes, there, was, there have been some great gags. That have, that have, <laughs> that have gone by the wayside. Gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, and I have like a videotape on my phone of a dance we, I staged in <laughs> rehearsal for That's, Enigma oh Variations, God, yes. in which I knew at the end of the first rehearsal, and it was very impossible for the actors, I spent an hour and a half on it. It was maybe ten, 20 seconds long. That's how long the video is. And I said to them, oh, that was so good. And we're going to cut it soon. <laughs> <laughs> but we didn't cut it right away. No. And then David saw it, laughed his head off. And we had it in rehearsal for a while. And as we went on, and as the play started to change, and we started to go, OK, that we'll shorten it. So we shortened it. OK, we'll shorten it more. Mm -hmm. Now we'll cut it, because now the play's done this. Yeah. You know, it, and it really is a kind of collaborative effort that way. And what it taught us was that, oh, that idea, later on, the dance idea emerged in a place that we didn't even think it could. And then it was, it was David saying, well, what if, what if you started moving like you know, crazy? And I'm like, oh, that's great. And then he'll have him sit there. And so we invent these, these gags like right there, you know, because of the work we've done throughout the rehearsal process. So, so stuff that ends essentially on the cutting room floor is, and that could be a source of great argument, isn't it? It's actually a source of great invention. And I, I should also say that, you know, I don't like putting act, it's not, I am a slave to actors rather than vice versa. I don't, and I don't like putting either actors or directors on the spot. And I find that if there is something, a line or a scene, that a good actor can't make work over three or four or five goes, it is not that actor's problem, it's not the director's problem, it's my problem. And so I have to go to work. I cannot, I cannot hang on to things because I love them. I have to, I have to change them to help the actor. I, I hate seeing an actor trying to muscle through something that is clearly not working. And so. Part of my job is just relieving agony. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I saw both um, Lives of the Saints and um, All in the Timing, and I loved them both. What was interesting to me was that they were staged in very different spaces. Yes. So I'm just wondering how that affected your directorial approach. It might not have affected your collaboration, but. Yeah, um, great. Yeah, um, all in the timing, if you saw, we did it at 59 East 59th Street. A, a theater, actually, I had never worked in before, and I was kind of fond of it. Um, it kind of this narrow little thing, and, and it reminded me of the original primary stages space, with the, which was so, also so narrow and, um, and fo focused. Um, and um, same designer did both shows, uh, Beowulf Borat, a wonderful collaborator. I adore him, too. And... Um, and, um, and he, he um, and that's maybe another thing to talk about too, but um, uh, the, the, uh, he, uh, when, we, when, we went, when we were at the Duke, because that's where primary stages had lost its lease or gave up on its lease, and then they were just renting for a little while while they wait for their permanent home to happen. Um, so we were at the Duke. And one of the things I knew about the evening was the Duke is a wide space. And I, you know, I've seen a couple of shows in there, and a couple of Shakespeare's in there. And I had five actors, and they have to do quick changes. And here's the thing, is I've done several evenings of one-act plays. And they usually take kind of a 
kind of a, uh, a space, a fun play space, and then you have to change it with a few pieces here and there and items. But those items have to get stored. They can't, there's no room. And then your actors are also doing quick changes. So you also have to have room for that. So at the Duke, there's none, if you, if you were to have a wide set, and then, then it's like, well, where are they going to do these changes? How are we going to change the scenery? And what are we, how is this going to work? And so I said to Beowulf, right from the start, when we moved in there, I said, you know, let's, let's just create like a little wonderful post-it stamp in that space. Make everyone have to look in the middle of the room, not, in, not the sides. Keep the focus narrow. Keep it tight. These, these are plays with two, two women or two men or three people. You know, the most we ever have on stage is the five, but they're all kind of in unison, so the eye can stay focused on the entire thing um, and create this kind of uh, crucible for the, for the action to take place. And so that's, that's how I approached uh, the, the, the wider space, was just by essentially narrowing it. And there's a bunch of blue all around it, and that's behind all of that. Of course, we're restoring everything, as you know, and where we're doing our crazy quick changes. And I learned very early on when I did Mere Mortals and a, a wonderful comic actor, a guy named Danton Stone, during tech, um, and um, we were, I don't know, we were doing a play, beautiful play, called Degas C'est Moi, in which there are maybe 14 different quick changes in it for the five actors, and, um, and, he, and he couldn't make an entrance, and he, he just, like during a tech, and he stopped, stop, and so, and he said, John, he just come, John, I just want you to come back here, just come back here. And so I got up on the stage, and, look, and you know, of course, there's all the actors like, with, they're like <laughs> barely making their changes, and they're, it's cramped space because there's all these props around them, and they're stuck. And I and I said, yes, the show is better here than it is out there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that's kind of the joy of doing these these evenings with with all those actors, trying to sort out the the, the, the logistics. But part of you know, we we spend a lot of time talking to the designers. You know, it's like yeah. Beowulf. We have you know we Beowulf had to go through a lot of, ver of, yeah. of drafts of this one to get it right because of the weirdness of that space. We also go through endless costume, costume discussions, often with Anita Yavich, who's done a lot of work. And so, so, and so everybody's on the same page that way. You know, It's like everybody understands how you got there. You can't look back and say, now, wait a minute. I don't know why we have this set. It stinks. You were there. You know? Yeah. You, you know? And so with everybody thinking together, it's you know yeah. you make it you make it right. And I would also point out that the, the brilliant if you saw Lives of the Saints or All in the Timing, transitions. I mean, trend, you know, these days transitions is the art of the director. You know, because so many people are writing plays of thirty-two short scenes. Mm -hmm. You know, and you have to go from a car to a hayrick to a barn to a restaurant, and and um, so it's a very particular art, and John is so brilliant at it, as you saw, because every one of the transitions was a little play. And um, the um, the one thing I want to talk about design too is that with like Beowulf, even on all the, especially on all the timing, because that was really his first David play, David Ives play, and he he had a few designs that were just fantastic, but were really not it. And um, and I went through a bit of discussion with him. And then we w he came up with a few imagery. And then I w we arrived at a place that I thought was interesting, but I knew wasn't right, but I thought was interesting. And I thought, L now we're going to, let's call David, and let's meet with David, and then let's look at it, and then let him talk, talk about it. And then we would meet with David, and David would say, you know, this is such and such. And then he would say, but you know, it feels like it needs to be a little more neutral so that, you know, and he would give us other clues. We'd go away, we'd have some conversation, and then Beowulf would come up with another design. We'd, we'd look at it together. I, I'd start to get excited by it. We brought it back to David. This is where we are right now. David goes, it's good, we're getting there, we're getting there, or this and this. And then I would say, well, I'm thinking, you know, and start to discuss how it might work and how it, and so we really do communicate. And part of the great thing of having a playwright like David is that, because he is also a, 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 man, a true man of the theater, really does understand the visual world of the theater. Um, and a lot of his plays are remarkable visual images. Enigma Variations, for example, 
two, uh, two doctors dressed identically in lab coats and two, two ladies. And, you know, the, what, a, what a funny, wonderful idea to just boom, two windows identical, they flip and they have the same, you know, this kind of thinking. Um, he's thinking always visual. He writes with usually a postcard on his desk of, of, a, of a, a something that gives him inspiration. In fact, um, for life signs, he handed me a, a postcard of, a, of four women sitting on the bench at this 1964 World's Fair and pointed at one of the women and said, that, the character that Liv is playing, Meredith, that's what I was looking at when I thought of, the, when I thought of her. I'm like, oh, thank you. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> we'll use that. And it helped you know? us so much. It, yeah. yeah. And so, so we're constantly you know, communicating visually as well as, as, well as poet, poetically. It's like one thing that, one design thing on this show that helped us immensely, which we didn't see at first. If you remember, we had all of this blue kind of velvet, and then there was, a, there was an archway. And after the first couple of previews, I said to John, you know, I wish that people knew what the, the titles of these plays are because it so informs them. And he said, we'll get Jason Lyons to do Gobos. And so we had to then negotiate with primary stages for the extra expense, because it was another $500 or something. But it made so much, so, you know, because between plays, then there was this, this sort of play of the titles. And John said, yes, they can, we can show all the titles and stop on the one where we're going to. And so they had something to look at if they weren't watching the transition. And, the, and it popped out. And then the play was informed by the title. And um, so just things like that. And it helped us so much. The audience just was reacting more after that. Anybody else? No? Uh, my, it got <coughs> it got oh, OK. Any other questions? No? Thank you. All right. Thank you. So Thanks, guys.